Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, tasks and how they can simplify, simplify your life with concurrency in modern C++. When I mean um, modern C++, I basically mean C++11, so everything you're going to see from now on is written in C++11. Uh, whether that's still considered modern is not up to me, but um, I think it's still pretty good. So yeah, let's just get started. So what is a task? Um, so I guess in the most general sense, it's just simply a unit of work that may or may not depend on other tasks. And so I just gave you guys some examples. So as you can see, it can be adding two numbers or doing some complicated analysis or making a web request. Uh, it's gonna really be anything. Um, in this talk, all tasks are sort of always organized in some graph that is directed um, because graphs are awesome and because they let you do certain things and have nice properties for concurrency, which, was, which we'll see later. And also a task is sort of always wrapping a functor and then it has some sort of, gives you, gives you access to some kind of handle which lets you get the result uh, of that computation at a later time. So this is a very simple graph of tasks. So in this uh, example, you see uh, three graphs, uh, three tasks in this graph. Uh, the parents at the top called something and something else. Mm, you can imagine maybe that they just compute some, some number, uh, return some number, and then the child task uh, at the bottom here is called adder and maybe just adds those two numbers together. Um, it's a, so in this case, it's a consumer, if you will. It's consuming the two, uh, the two uh, parent tasks. Um, and you can see here that the parents are sort of independent with regard to the child and can therefore be run in parallel. So task-based concurrency um, is concerned with units of work only and not with threads. It's actually, in fact, a well-designed orthogonal to threads. So it's, it's just simply independent of particular threads. And that allows us to just focus on, the, on getting stuff done because we don't have to deal with explicit threads. We don't have to you know, do launch threads and threads are not explicitly tied to explicit functions. And it also lets us organize our work into logical and possibly uh, dependent tasks and you therefore get some sort of parallelism by design. Um, but yeah, it's obviously not magic and it does not help with uh, your data races. So if you have memory that's shared um, across threads, then you still may have to protect that. So to get started, we're gonna have a look at two simple concurrency problems um, and we're gonna then compare three libraries uh, the, the standard library, as it currently is uh, in C++11, not much in this regard has changed in C++17, maybe a little bit. Um, uh, we're gonna look at Boost, and then we're gonna look at a library called Transwap that uh, I recently authored. And we want to basically achieve two goals here. We want to uh, repeatedly run the very first function there that just adds one to, to an integer and we want to run that on a different thread. Uh, and then second task would be, second problem to solve would be to repeatedly run add one and then mod two, both on separate threads. So by separate, I mean just different from the main thread, just any other thread. Um, so there's a dependency here, as you can see, and the second problem. So add one will run on a different thread, and then once that is finished, we'll, we'll run mod two on a different thread. Okay, so let's see what that uh, looks like using um, some primitives from the standard library. Um, so I, in the following, I'm just calling this like the classic approach because you're do, dealing with condition variables, mutexes, atomics. Um, it's not gonna be pretty and I never want you to write code like this, but you've probably all seen code like this and maybe also written it. Um, for all of this, we're, so 
these examples, these simple examples here are just going to be in a, simple, in a single translation unit, just for simplicity. And we're also ignoring exception handling because that's just going to make it more ugly. So, um, so to solve the very first problem that we've seen, to, to just run the function add one um, on a separate thread, we need a few variables to get started. So we need to determine whether the app actually wants to quit processing. So we've got our Boolean quit. Uh, then we're going to need Atomic to, to check whether the result has been computed. Um, we got uh, another Boolean here indicating whether we want to actually start processing. And then the condition variables in the mutex to notify the worker thread. Um, the, uh, the Atomic over here, as you will see, can, could also be replaced with another condition variable in mutex. But uh, that's sort of up to you. So this is what the worker thread would look like. Um, you're probably very familiar with this code, I imagine. Um, it's also sort of the standard pattern with which you would use to implement a thread pool. So you have just some, some worker function here and an infinite, infinite loop. Uh, this, this function is then actually run on a separate thread. And then the first thing you do, you uh, open another scope here um, for this particular lock. You lock, uh, you lock the mutex M, which is in global scope here, and then you uh, start waiting until you actually start processing. Um, so this lambda here, you actually need to prevent spurious wake-ups. So when the condition variable actually gets notified, um, it will then check this, this uh, function here, this lambda, and if that returns true, then it will actually exit uh, waiting. And it will continue here. If we want to quit the, quit the app, then it will just return. It will just exit the thread. Uh, otherwise, we'll set start to false, exit the scope here, so the mutex will come, become unlocked. And then we finally run the function that we want to run. Right? And then we set them to true, which signals that result is available. So. By the way, I'm not guaranteeing that this code is actually bug free, but that's what it is now. Um, and this would be the main function where you would actually um, launch your thread right here. Um, and then we're just doing this like three times. Um, we lock our mutex, uh, set start to true. Then we notify the, con the condition variable. Now we actually, now we are basically right here and then it will start uh, processing. So now we can just wait until res the result is available. Like I said earlier, this could be also replaced with another condition variable. And then we simply output the result. And then the, after the while loop, we want to terminate the app. So we need to log again, uh, set quit to true, notify, and then join the thread. Uh, and then the output is very simple, just one, two, three. So, um, yeah, in my opinion, this code is a bit error prone and ugly. So let's see how we can improve on this. Um, first, there is something called std async, which probably most of you know, which um, lets you run a given functor, also with arguments if you want, uh, on, a, on a separate thread. Uh, given your launch policy is launch async. So this whole code that you've seen before in the last, in the past three slides now simplifies to, um, simplifies to this. So in your main function now, you, all you do is you, uh, we just have a while loop three times, uh, three iterations. We launch our function using, uh, using a std async. Uh, so this will actually launch a new thread. <coughs> I believe on actually on every iteration. Uh, and then we'll just wait for the result and we print the result. So that's pretty easy and it looks pretty good. But we now have the problem that we don't have control over the thread that is actually used to, to run the operation. Plus, uh, in the worst case, I believe it's actually implementation dependent. You might actually get a, a new thread on every iteration, which can cause an arbitrary overhead. So let's see how we can do better. So th this is where Boost comes in. So Boost uh, also has the async, but 
in addition to, to what the standard library currently uh, provides, it also has support for executors. And executors are really cool because, uh, because they let, uh, actually let you control, this is the executor here, uh, to, to control where you actually want to run your uh, operations. So this, ex this executor is just a simple thread pool, launch, launches for thread on, on construction. And then, <coughs> yeah, and then when it, it gets some function, which is basically through the submit function down here. So a boost executor has to, has to implement the submit function. Uh, and then it will just push that into a FIFO queue. And then in the, in the worker thread of the, of the thread pool, the, um, the, 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 the oldest element is basically popped off uh, from the queue and then simply run on, uh, on, a, on a given thread. Of course, it's random which thread is actually picked in this case. So we got our async and our wait. So I think this is probably as good as it's going to get. Um, since you're using a custom executor here, you can actually um, define any thread that you, that you want to, to use for this execution here. You can, for example, run this on a UI thread or on, a, on an audio thread if you want. OK, so this is pretty cool. Uh, let's look at the next library, um, Transwarp. So the difference with Transwarp is that you now uh, define your task up front. Um, so using the factory function make task here. So I'm using TW here as a namespace. Actually, namespace is actually Transwarp, but just to keep it a bit brief for this uh, presentation. And what you do is you pass in the task type, which can either be root, consume, or wait, depending on what you're doing. Since this task doesn't have any parents, it has to be a root task. And then you just sim pass, simply pass in the functor. And then in your while loop, you just call schedule and give it an executor. Uh, executor is similar to that, to that in Boost, except it, do it doesn't use, uh, it's not dispatched statically at compile time, but, but, <coughs> dyna but dynamically at runtime. Um, so you have to, and there's an interface for that, so you have to implement this basically. Uh, has an execute has a name and then an execute function, which takes a functor and a node. Uh, node is simply some, some sort of struct that, uh, some sort of container that holds metadata of the current, um, of the current task. So once you call schedule, um, the actual uh, function is invoked on the given executor and then you wait for, for completion. So task doesn't currently have mm, direct methods to get the result or wait for the result, which may be a future extension, but currently you have to get the shared future here and then wait for, it, wait for the um, completion. Okay. Now to the second problem. So Previously, we just wanted to run a single function uh, asynchronously. Now we, want, now we have two functions that we want, on separate that we want to run on separate threads, but also <coughs> we want to somehow be able to handle the dependency that there is. So we have add one uh, that we want to execute first and then mod two. So the classic approach with mutex and stuff is actually um, so complicated for the specific, um, for this presentation that I'm just not going to show you to prevent brain injuries. But essentially, what happens is that you have another set of logs, mutex, and condition variables. Most of you can probably imagine what this looks like. And you have another worker function to wait for uh, add one and then ru run mal two, and then another thread that runs the second uh, worker function. And then your output is basically 2, 6, 14, because first you uh, add 1, and then you, then you double the result, add 1, double the result, and, and so on. So unfortunately, there's no uh, way of actually doing this in the standard library with futures currently. Uh, but hopefully, that will come in C++20 through the current concurrency TS. Right now, right now we can. Uh, do this actually quite nicely in Boost. So again, we define our uh, executor up here, which is, again, just a thread pool with four threads. Um, we launch 
our first task, and then we define something like a uh, something called a continuation using dot then, which uh, also accepts an executor, and then it accepts a uh, a functor whose first argument is the type of the future that you called dot then on, um, and in this, in this uh, lambda, you basically guarantee that the future has finished. Um, so you could actually use the result if you, if you want it. You could call .get on it, which we'll see later. But in this, in this example, we don't actually need to. Um, and then we just use the final future here and call .wait on it. Uh, and you can, you can see that this is actually a graph, because a graph consisting of two nodes, two tasks, one at the top, one at the bottom. And it's directed. one direction of flow. <coughs> cool. So this is what it looks like in uh, Transwarp. So here, um, again, we, we, have an, we have an executor, which is, again, just a thread pool. We have, uh, we then build our task graph up front. Uh, just like before, we have task one. But now task two becomes a parent task of, at, of task two, which is the child task. Um, which now waits for the completion of, of task one uh, and then runs mal2. And this looks like, uh, then in the while loop, it actually looks like this. You take the final task that you defined here and you just call schedule all on it. And that will actually execute all tasks that you defined in your mm, model of tasks, in your task graph, um, in the right order. So we'll first go to task one. Uh, Grab the, grab the functor from there, throw it into the executor, and then move on to task two. So when you call task two, dot wait, after that you basically guarantee that all of tasks have been finished, have finished uh, com uh, calculating. Cool. So what we've seen so far, um, yeah, we solved two very simple concurrency problems, we've seen four approaches, and uh, we've seen that the classic approach is a bit complicated and error-prone. Uh, threads are actually bound to functions we want to calculate, which is something to avoid. And uh, I reckon it's pretty hard to extend when your dependencies actually change. On the other hand, um, we've seen uh, std async, which makes code simpler, but because it, because it doesn't support, because there's no dependencies, dependency support for futures, no continuation support for futures in the current standard, or support for executor, executors, custom executors, there's really not, not much use for this function currently, I think, except for maybe prototyping. Uh, in the boost approach, um, this actually solves the current shortcomings of the C++ standard, uh, support for executors and continuations. Um, with Transwarp, uh, the transfer operator is actually similar to boost, except that tasks can be scheduled multiple times. And it lets you sort of build the task up front as a model of the operations. So it doesn't actually, not, so not only your <coughs> operation, your tasks are separated or sort of orthogonal to your threads, but also your model is independent of your execution somewhat. So there are also other great libraries that I want to point out that you might want to check out for, uh, for task parallelism. So there's HPX, um, which, is, uh, which is a huge library, uh, great stuff in there. Um, has a very similar interface to Boost with regard to futures, um, but it does not seem that, that they provide a sort of task graphs from multiple in in invocations. Uh, and TBB supports continuations, uh, also for multiple invocations, However, the API seems somewhat um, harder to use than that of HPX or Boost. Uh, STLab, um, I've also found very useful. It has uh, Boost-like future support for one-shot graphs and introduces some, uh, so something called channels uh, for multiple implications. So let's have a look at a slightly more evolved problem maybe a problem that you would find uh, maybe in your in real code. So for this, we want to generate some random values, in this case from a gamma distribution. Mm. And we want to compute statistical key measures from that distribution. So we want to compute an average, standard deviation, mode, and median. 
So those are just, just some functions, basically, and they return a single value, right? It's just some, some measure of that distribution. Um, so the standard deviation is, uh, is given right here. And as you can see, um, it is, so it's basically just the, the mean deviation uh, across the mean, across the average, the mean deviation across the average. And uh, so it actually depends on the average. So for this, we want to actually model it in such a way that we compute the average first and then the standard deviation. So there will be a dependency. So let's see what this actually looks like in a, uh, in a graph of tasks. So this task graph was uh, generated by Transweb. Um, so once you've set up your, your, your graph of tasks, you can then actually um, generate a dot file. And then the dot file can be just rendered into an SVG or something. So this is what you see here. Mm, at the top, you have your uh, root task, so the initial parent tasks. You have the, the sample size, so the, the size of how many random values basically do we have. We have alpha and beta, which are just parameters of the gamma distribution. They're usually in the range between like, I don't know, 0.5 and 3 or so. Uh, and then you have a random number generator that which you need to then actually create the gamma distribution. Uh, like in C++ 11 style, right? Using the, using the random uh, header. And then all of these uh, tasks then flow into generate gamma, which is a function that basically consumes these parameters and then creates some random values. And then um, we have basically four dependent child tasks. We have the standard deviation, uh, we have the, the average, calculation, median, and mode. And then all of these, once they're finished calculated, calculating, um, are going to flow into a function that simply aggregates these four numbers into a struct. Okay, so before we move on, we need to just look at the definition of these of these functions real quick. So we got our uh, our data type here, which is a shared point of vector of, of double. Uh, we got our generate gamma function, uh, which takes the sample size alpha, beta, and then random number generator. Uh, we've got a function to compute the average, uh, standard deviation, which depends on the average. We've got the median, which just depends on the data, and the mode, just the data. And then at the end, we have a function that just simply aggregates all values uh, and returns a struct called result that holds the results. So let's see what that looks like in, uh, in Boost. So with Boost, again, um, we have a nice uh, thread pool here, which we create for this purpose. Can be any executor, of course, of your liking. Mm. We have alpha and beta. Oh, sorry, I actually should mention, let me just go back to, the, uh, to this guy here. So you can actually, I, I was mentioning at, at the beginning, remember this, uh, this simple graph that had three tasks? And I was saying that you know, the parents are sort of independent with regard to the child. So the same happens here, right? Just on a little slightly larger scale, right? So all of these guys can run in parallel. And, um, and then these two can run in parallel. And also this branch can run in parallel, right? But they depend on each other. So this one will always run first and then be consumed by this guy. So, Okay, so let's see how this is solved in Boost. So we got a uh, while loop again that runs three iterations. And we have a function that is compu called compute graph where all the magic happens, which takes an executor and the parameters that we need. And then once we have the future, uh, which is sort of like the last uh, task in, this, uh, in the graph that you've seen, we can call dot get on it get the result, and then print it. And then we just simply change alpha and beta to get slightly different outcomes next time around, increment count. Okay, so let's see what compute graph looks like. Um, so, yeah, so Boost provides this nice function called make ready future, which simply takes a single value, <coughs> um, assigns, a pro uh, assigns it to a promise, and then you can get the future from that. So that's what, what's happening internally in this function. But essentially, it's just a future that has, that's already ready. 
right? So you can directly use it. So we have to wrap these parameters uh, that we have into these ready futures. And then we can, um, and then to actually use it in the, in the next child task, um, the generate gamma function, the generate gamma task, we then actually have to first wrap those future futures. Um, and we're doing that we're using boost when all. So for that, we have to move the futures because they are not copyable. And then we can then call dot then on, the, on, on this guy, on the future of futures, passing the executor, and then uh, passing the lambda, which then lets us actually do our, our work. So when, we, when it gets to this point, f will be the future of futures, so we have to call dead got get on it to get a tuple of futures. And then we can, uh, knowing, knowing the right indices, depending on the way we pass it into win all, we can then uh, go through the different results here and get our parameters and then call generate gamma. Uh, we have to call dot share on it here to get a shared future because as you've seen in the graph, um, the generate gamma uh, result is actually shared by multiple ch childs. So we also compute the average in a similar way, uh, except we're not calling dot then on the parameters, we're calling dot then on the, on the date, on the future for the data, right? This is this guy. Calling dot then on it, and then we are calling, um, using that result, using f.get, call the average function that you've seen earlier. Also call dot share on it because the average function is shared by two tasks. It's shared by the standard, the standard deviation function and by the uh, aggregate result function. And now what we have to do to actually compute the standard deviation, we have to again wrap the, uh, the, the data, the future for the data and the future for the average into a when all call to get a future of futures. Then called on that on called called on that dot then on that, um, and then we can iter iterate in this way here through our tuple of futures, and then compute the standard deviation. We can do that for the median as well. Um, we don't need to, as you see here, we don't need to call the dot share on it because they are going to be moved into the aggregate task immediately. We're computing the mode in the same way as the median. Um, and then we just wait for everyone to finish using boost win all again. Okay, this is what's happening here. So average, future, standard deviation, future, median, future, and mode future. We're waiting for those. And then we simply call dot then and passing the executor again. And then knowing our indices, we can then pass the results into the aggregate function. And now we finally have our future that lets us um, do our work. Okay, that was a lot of code. So let's see what this looks like with uh, Transwarp. So like I was pointing out earlier, with Transwarp we are creating the task graph up front. So now instead of having a compute function inside the while loop, <coughs> it's now uh, outside and called build graph instead of compute graph. It also doesn't take an executor because it's independent from the execution at this point. So, um, yeah, and the rest looks very similar. So we create a, a thread pool here, and we are calling schedule all on the final task that, we're that we are retrieving from the build graph function, passing in the executor. So this will schedule all functions in right order, start starting at the top of the graph and then trickling down. And again, changing input and so on three iterations. So let's check out uh, build graph. Um, so this is only two slides, so don't be scared. Um, this uh, takes these three parameters. It takes alpha and beta by reference because they're actually being changed later on. And it returns a share pointer of the, of the task class. And it takes a, uh, of, of the result struct that I was mentioning earlier. Um, so the first three tasks are fairly mm, straightforward. Uh, I think they're all straightforward, actually. Um, but they're root tasks. They don't, they don't have any parents. Uh, so you just pass in the lambda mm, with the 
with the result uh, value, basically. And then the data task that actually consumes the parameter task is, uh, is this guy. So um, it consumes them, so which means that the generate gamma function basically has to, you know, we're passing in four, four tasks here, so the generate gamma function is expected to have four parameters that it takes uh, in, in its function signature. And then the rest is uh, straightforward. So we have our average task, which consumes the data task. We have our standard deviation task, which consumes standard deviation, uh, sorry, data, data task and the average task. Our median task consumes the data task. Mode task consumes the data task. And then we just wrap it up by calling make task again uh, using the aggregate function and passing in uh, our, our aggregated results, return, and then we to return that. So I've talked a little bit about, about executors. And <coughs> so this is the execute interface that's used in, in Transwarp. Uh, in, uh, for boost, this would simply boil down to a single function uh, called submit, um, which is actually more, which should actually be a concept because it's a template parameter. Um, so the functor, uh, like I said earlier, in the execute function is a function to be run. Um, and the node is a container carrying metadata of the current task. So in transport currently, there are two executors predefined. There's a sequential operator. I'm not sure if that's the greatest name for it, but it just runs your task on the same thread as the call to schedule. So it's very simple. It just returns a name and um, then just the execute function simply runs a functor that's given to it. Uh, it also has a functor, uh, sorry, an executor for a parallel execution. I, am, I omitted the get name here for space uh, reasons. So this is simply using a thread pool under the hood. Um, so your initial thread pool is initialized in the constructor and then the functor is pushed into the thread pool. That's fairly simple. Now the problem with thread pools typically is that they lock, um, that they lock, have locks because they have to lock the queue that's used between threads, uh, pushing and popping, right? Now, how can that be prevented? Well, you could use, you could write an executor that uses a queue that is actually lock free. And in this case, I didn't write it myself. I um, uh, didn't want to go through that pain, but there is one in Boost, luckily, Boost lock free, single producer, single consumer queue. <coughs> which uh, has lock-free and, and actually wait-free push and pop. And uh, with that, you can basically um, have your execute function look like that, just like before. And then in your, in your worker function, which is now, of course, since you're using a single a single consumer queue, is now basically it has to, it can only have a single thread here. So mm, this could be your audio thread, for instance. So you have a, um, you define your you define your functor you want to run, uh, and then you loop until the pop was successful. Once it is successful, uh, then you go here. Unless you unless you of course done is tr also true. Then in this case you would just exit. But if it's not, if it just has been successful, then you run the functor. Okay. And yeah, and with that we're coming to conclusions. Um, so we've seen two very simple concurrency problems. We've seen um, a real-world case study from statistics and how to define custom executors. And the takeaway is that I think task-based approaches greatly simplify concurrent code um, and maybe soon with coroutines uh, even more. Um, task-based concurrency is orthogonal to threats. Um, and Unfortunately, the futures in the current standard are pretty weak, but will soon hopefully be better. Um, I think right now they're almost not, well, they're not very useful for real world applications, I think, because of their lack for continuations and executors. Um, but Boost, luckily, uh, has that built in. <coughs> uh, transfer provides a task graph for multiple invocations, as you've seen, and 
executors can be powerful tool to schedule tasks on uh, user-defined threads. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you. Are there questions? That's a good question. I think that really depends on your application. You just have to measure it, I believe. But it also depends on the library that you're using. I think um, I think what Boost is doing is probably very efficient, and it uh, you basically have to always decide on when to when you when you want to share a future, for instance, which makes it more efficient. Uh, in Transform, for instance, everything is a sh is a shared future by default. So you don't have the choice um, to use a regular future, um, which has some implications, f um, obviously, because uh, because shared state. Um, also, when you move a shared future, it doesn't actually move the the, the thing, right? Um, so, for instance, with transwarp, another thing to keep in mind is that so this is the sched this implementation of the schedule function, which is which is which is called when every single task is scheduled, right? So you basically have some overhead here because, because of just what's happening here, right? So you're creating a, like a, a std package task here, and then you get the future, <coughs> and then, um, so the future will then be part of the task class. And then you call the executor and pass that along, <coughs> right? So there's certainly some overhead. Um, and I've also ran uh, two benchmarks when you, if you want to have a look at the, at the GitHub repository. Um, so especially, in particular for those examples, I didn't see a difference even compared to regular function calls. Um, but I've only tested on one architecture. And uh, I suppose in general, if something's easier to use in C++, it usually comes with an overhead, right? Um, so you got to be sort of mindful of that. Yeah. In your uh, standard deviation calculation, how would you um, parallelize the um, the subtraction of each each uh, element? Oh, right. Um, I actually, this is like totally not the focus of of this. Um, bec this is. Um, because this would almost be a, because uh, it's like, how do you say that? It's well, like. You can actually, you can add another node in your task here. Yeah. With uh, xi minus the mm. xi plus the 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 xi Right. Oh, I was also supposed to actually repeat the questions, I remember now. Um, so the question was, how can you parallelize the, Basically, the sum, right? You want to parallelize the sum, yeah. So that's like, okay, that's the word I was looking for. It's sort of like an embarrassingly parallel problem or something like that, right? So here you should, um, you should either you could use uh, something like a thread pool directly inside a given task, or maybe something from uh, C++ 17, maybe use a use use a, par a parallelized algorithm from from that. Or whatever else. So I just, I just see it based on the, the, the yeah. calculation graph, right? That's right. Be the biggest pain of the intersection. Right. So well, I think I think it's sort of getting back to to Dean's question. I think you don't want to do those type of type of task in and then put that into a graph like this because they're just too small. I think the overhead would be too large, right? So rather, what you want to do is put larger tasks, like this whole calculation of standard deviation, make that a task. Uh, 
Yes, I think. Uh, maybe we can talk about TensorFlow afterwards. Right. And your question was? So if I have a lambda that, for example, captures a unique pointer, then yeah. I can't use it because it's not copy control. Right. So, so the question was? So do you have any? The question was that the. Right. Um, so, well, there, there, I think there's two questions here. One is uh, the executor takes us to a function. No, it's so, just a use case that mm -hmm. I, I want to, to use the executor to run a move on a callable object. So, does the query fix for that use case? Yes, it does. Uh, because this is actually not a problem. Because if you have a look at the schedule implementation here, um, so, what it actually does, it creates a package task uh, or we're using make shared. So, it creates a shared pointer to make a I'm package task. The executor, the executor is, uh, enterprise. It yes. It does. So that's that's if you have that mm -hmm. function, that means it has to be copyable. You can't capture yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. So, let me just summarize the question again. So, you want to know. Uh, whether there's uh, any issues with copyable or movable objects, move only objects, move only objects with the executor, and especially regarding to the execute function. So since we're creating a, a shared point of the package task and creating a, capturing that in, in a lambda here, so that is basically what's being run in the, in the executor. Yes. So, so all that's, so <coughs> and this lambda is converted to a std function on yeah, call, and then, Yeah, but that's okay because the shared pointer is copy constructible, and it does not matter what is actually passed into the task in the beginning, uh, since we're creating a shared pointer of the package task. So the shared pointer will always be copyable. That's right, but the ex but all that the this guy right. So all that the std function. Uh, represents here is a lambda that captured a shared pointer. So it's perfectly copyable. Oh, okay. hmm. yeah. Are you using your testing model in production code? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's actually just been, just, just went to version 1.0 and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a few, few more improvements. Uh, in particular, this in particular this schedule um, uh, performance, but also adding a few more methods which might be useful, like such as wait and get directly without having to get the future. Uh, maybe having a f task for uh, uh, having a function to create a ready task immediately. Also, be nice to improve on error messages. And uh, but yeah, once it's, um, I, I believe it can be used in production. I have high confidence, but um, check it out, and if you find any problems with it, I'm accepting pull requests. So, yeah. Jason? What compiler are you supporting? Uh, currently, it is tested, thanks to your Zeros Plus Weekly, by the way, <laughs> on, uh, on uh, GCC, Clang, and the Visual Studio. Oh. It was already before, but then uh, I finally figured out how to use Travis, and What's the other thing for Windows? App Bear? App yeah. Right. So now it's doing all of that too. So. Yeah. I see where Bessel falls in this query. I can't see if this kind of thing can be done. Maybe Dali is in a performance bug, in a rough performance version of Trinity, which might allow us a performance bridge implementation. For the implementation that we've seen now? Yeah. The So 
so what what I have done yeah so so what I have done also the question sorry the question was uh, are there any performance measurements um, for the code that we've seen uh, comparing the different implementations so what I have done is I have used the the example for the uh, statistical distribution uh, and ran that through transform and then also com and then compared that with regular function calls uh, just on a single thread everything on a single thread and at least on the architecture that I've been looking at, I can barely see a difference. Um, there's a difference in debug mode of like maybe seven to 10% or something, but then in release mode it goes down to like 1% or something, or even lower, sometimes immeasurable. So the question is, what happens when an exception is thrown in one of the callables? That's okay because of uh, uh, because of awesome uh, standard library. So we're creating a uh, package task here of um, again package task is awesome, I guess uh, of the of the function we want to run. It. In this case, it's evaluate and evaluate will basically call the functor that you passed in originally into the task, and uh, package task will basically catch any exceptions <coughs> and then put them into a promise so that when you actually call, so the execute function is actually no accept, right? So they will, uh, well, depends on the implementation, of course, but the functor will not throw. Um, what will happen is that once you call get future and then dot get, that will actually then, then throw the exception that was thrown by your functor that you passed in. So your library, <coughs> it, it has a dot get condition, or will you just pass it as a... Say that again? The, did your library have a dot get once you um, get to the future? Uh, so Transwarp has a get future, so you can basically get a hold of this future here, of this shared future, and then you can do dot get or dot wait. Yeah, basically, just like in this code here. Uh, basically, just like right here, right? So this is your task here from the build graph function. You get the future, which returns a shared future. And uh, then you can, then you call dot get. Could you invoke multiple, so can you, can you schedule all tasks some day, so have two runs of that task running for the same single one running Yes. Yes. So the question. Yes. Yes, you actually can. So the question was, can you actually schedule this, this the task group twice with m with different inputs? Uh, yes, you can actually. Uh, so this is basically what's happening here, right? So we um, get the future here. So first, we schedule. That schedules all the computations uh, trickling down from the top of the graph all the way down, uh, th and then we get the result. Um, and then we change our inputs here, right? This alpha and beta. So alpha and beta are actually accepted by reference here, right, into the build graph function. Um, so they change, and then the next iteration we call schedule all. Oh, right. Yes, you can also do that. So you can basically m write your own schedule all if you want, right? Basically run the very first task that you want, maybe first. So you can just, let's say this returned a two tasks, right? Task one and task two. Then you can run task, you can go task one, schedule, task two, schedule. Uh, and then you can schedule all two if you want, right? So you can either schedule them separately using s the schedule method or schedule all, which will always start at the current task that you scheduled all, that you called scheduled all on, and then it will basically go at the top and then trickle down to that specific task. Yeah. Why doesn't schedule all return a future So the question was, why doesn't schedule all return a future directly? Um, so
so, well, first of all, schedule all schedules, like all tasks in the graph. So it would have to maybe return a, a vector of futures or something, right? If you want to make it general. So, and then you have to, again, deal with indices, right? And that's, I guess, something to avoid, I think. But it would technically be possible. It would, it would, it would actually solve one problem doing that. And that is that currently the future has, is actually a member of the task, right? But that actually has implement, implementation, uh, implications for lifetime, right? Yeah, but, but the main reason is usability, actually, because otherwise you would have to return all futures because you don't actually know which one you're interested in, right? But how do you get dictionaries? Well, so all the tasks uh, have their own future, right? Which corresponds to, to, to the result of that, of that specific task. Maybe we can chat about this after? Sure. More detail? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So does, uh, does creating the tasks and this graph, is there a way for you to validate that it will actually uh, everything? Or could you have like cycles that this graph has never, never ever uh, returns or finishes? So there cannot be any cycles in this graph because the Oh, sorry, the question was, can you have cycles and maybe uh, not ever and exit the graph, right? Mm, you cannot have cycles because the tasks are actually, mm, when they're instantiated, they demand their parent tasks. They demand their dependencies on instantiation. So by, defi by definition, you cannot have cycles this way. Um, and you can, the only way to actually get into the situation where you um, block Forever would be if you would be if you're doing something wrong with the functors that you're passing in, right? Because this this library does not know anything about the specific functors that you use, except for input parameters and and stuff like that and, and types and so on. But it doesn't know now what you do in the body of those functors. But other than that, I think the library itself doesn't have issues with blocking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you have unlimited elements here, that's actually the one that can actually really approximate, I mean, you know, parallelization. So if there was a way of actually running for every element right away, you could build mm. something completely independent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, okay, so the question is, mm, back to standard deviation, how can we model this in, in Transwarp in this library or other libraries possibly? Um, yeah. Yeah, coroutines. <laughs> yes, that's, we should solve it with coroutines. <laughs> but uh, I, I think maybe there is a way to, in, to like sort of integrate this sort of problem into, into the library, but I want to focus on sort of the tasks that are actually dependent, but at the same time, you, can, uh, you may get branches in your graph that you can then run in parallel by design because that's the way you've set it up. Uh, but I did not focus on like, embarrassingly parallel problems like this one, right? So I think you should probably use a different library for that. Unless maybe if you want to have out, you find a different way of uh, of doing this in that library. Yes. Um, so the question is, uh, when we were looking at the statistical thing, oh sorry, 
statistical example here about this guy, right, for instance. So basically the question is, you know, when we're doing this, uh, getting the results there to pass, to pass in to the depending, uh, to the dependent function, we could use something like, uh, what are they called again? Structured bindings. Um, but this is C++ 11, right? So we don't have that available. But absolutely, I think this code will become, will become much nicer in C++ uh, 17. Maybe not as horrifying. But yeah, good point. Also, I believe we would be able to, and we don't have to use decal type here, we could just yeah. use auto, right? So that'd be another simplification. Cool. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.